Um, so I'm going to talk about if uh, CT results vary by slope angle. So maybe um, we'll have some more information for Doug, the skeptic over here, about slope angles and, and different stability tests. Um, and just want to acknowledge Doug here. You probably, none of you, I don't know how many of you got to see Doug in Sunset Magazine. It was like right next to all the stuff about like your mom's cookie recipes. I think that would be a good thing to put in the Avalanche Review or something. Living the dream, fast and furious. Um, all right, the consequences of uh, digging pits in high risk terrain can be severe. And this is actually a pit that, that Doug and Chris Lundy dug years ago. And when they stepped out of the pit, boom, they triggered this big avalanche. And they felt like they needed to be an avalanche train to be digging snow pits. They needed to be on something 35 degrees. And, um, and when I first heard of some of the work that, that Bruce had done and his graduate students looking at slope angle and PSTs, I thought, would this work for ECTs? And um, so we started doing you know, our different ECT tests and looking at the relationship between ECT, um, ECT tests and slope angles. And what we found was that the ECT test results seemed to be fairly independent of slope angle, uh, much like the PST, which was very counterintuitive. I know that when I collected my first data set, I collected the data set, I came home with it, and I thought about it all night, and I thought, it just can't be right. And I went back the next day and collected a whole nother data set, and it came out just the same. And I was scratching my head, well, you know, maybe there's something to this. So, so we've seen that these ECTP results are relatively independent of slope angle. And our experience is that the relationship between ECT and CT results doesn't seem to vary by slope angle. With most of our tests, it seems like CTs are a tap or two less than the ECTs. Um, and we don't see a change with slope angle that much. And so what, what I would think then is that if the ECT is independent of slope angle, if we're not seeing a change with slope angle, then the CT would be as well. Um, I was challenged on this by, by Ned Baer. And Ned said, no, I really think the CT results vary a lot by slope angle because that's initiation. But the ECT results don't because that's propagation. So CT results definitely should vary. And um, so we argued back and forth because I said, geez, it just doesn't seem like we're seeing that. And, um, and I said, well, we got to go collect some data. So back to the same old study plot there down at Lionhead. We had um, kind of perfect conditions. It's a, you know, just sort of a mellow rollover type of slope. And you can just work your way right uphill and get some varying slope angles uh, with your tests. And I was measuring slope angle with a Cinto inclinometer and, and um, weak layer depth. And we're just going to go through this stuff pretty quick. But we had a buried layer surface hoar. This was a soft slab. Slab's about, what, close to 50 centimeters. Um, and you know the hardest layer there is about four fingers. So soft slab conditions. There's your weak layer. And that's what the weak layer looked like, kind of almost a double layer of surface hoar. And this is the same weak layer that we'll see later that we worked with on uh, bacon rind. So, run a little video. <clears throat> so, I do when, when I'm doing my test, if I have a layer that starts to break and move, I I remove that. So that's an ECTP twelve on the surface or layer down here. And we've been doing a bunch of ECTs on varying slope angles and find very consistent results between about eleven and thirteen right on the surface or we're doing CTs next to them, so we're doing CT next to them. CT11 on the same layer that the ECT work on. And what we're finding is a very consistent relationship between the ECTs and the CTs, where the CTs are either the same 
or maybe one or two taps less than the ECTs, um, independent of slope angle, so whether it's flat or steep. All right, we tested slope angles from 17 to 30 degrees, and I really wanted to test slope angles a little bit steeper than 30 degrees, and this is what happened when I tried. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I took a few steps too far down the slope, and I looked back at Doug first and said, this just doesn't feel right. And then I took a couple more steps, and the entire slope collapsed, and I was turning around to run back up my boot track, and, um, and the whole slope just moved a little bit and collapsed. And so we basically ruined everything around there that was any steeper than 30 degrees. So, um, so anyway, we looked at slopes from 17 to 30 degrees on this day, and here's the ECTP data. Um, again, we're varying from 12 to 15 and we don't see any trend with slope angle. And then we look at our CT data. CT data varied from 11 to 13. And again, no trend with slope angle. And then if we look at the difference between the two, we see that sometimes there's no difference, one, two, or three more taps with the ECT. And again, we're not seeing um, slope angle. Now, or a, a relationship to slope angle. Now, we're just looking at one data set, one snow pit, one snow pack. And so what we thought we would do is mine the whole snow pilot data set for where we have ECTPs that fail on what you identify as your problematic weak layer and CTs and look at the difference over all the slope angles in that data set. Um, we haven't finished that analysis yet, but Doug did go into the data from the, from the Gallatin for the last two years. And this is the difference between ECTP and CT tests. And here's the, the difference, and here's the slope angle. So we have slope angles from down around 15 up to around 40. And you can see that there's no real clear trend. If you draw a trend line through here, you get a very weak positive trend. But, but you know, in general, there's just a lot of scatter. We'll see when we get the whole Snow Pilot data set together. And what this, what this suggests, it doesn't prove, but what it suggests is that if the ECT is independent of slope angle, then so is the CT. Practical implications, I think, are, you know, if, if snow conditions are reasonably similar, observers can conduct tests on low angle slopes before committing to steeper terrain. Um, you know, I think the stuff that we've done so far in the CT is very preliminary. Um, but it is, you know, one, one data set for this. Um, whether it applies for both persistent and non-persistent weak layers, we don't know. For the ECT, we've done work on both persistent and non-persistent weak layers. Ron collected a couple of data sets in Alaska on non-persistent weak layers, and we didn't see a slope angle effect with the non-persistent weak layers either. So just to point out, you know, this is the accident that, uh, that Dudley went and investigated um, at Altoona Ridge near Phillipsburg. And one of the things that happened here, and Dudley could, could elaborate, but you know, they weren't necessarily planning on skiing a lot of this terrain, but they went down into it with the idea of digging a snow pit. And so he just got a little low on, you know, this, the victim got low on the slope and triggered the avalanche from right here instead of maybe waiting and trying to do something up here in the low angle terrain. So it's just something that we want to try and emphasize, I think, to people. You know, we're, right now, you know, we can't say anything for certain, but we are seeing that these test results aren't varying a lot from steeper to low angle terrain, and yet the low angle terrain is so much safer. So why not try your tests on low angle terrain first? Carl, I'll just say on that. That could have led them into a problem. Anyway, if they had dug up higher on a less shallow slope, gotten a stable, as you know, we don't look for stability in snow pits, but right. they had gotten a stable result and they deflected the ski day. That was a, that was a uh, death floor there. They yeah. They could have hit those shallow rocks. And yeah. I figured that thing anyway, but the points, well taken, why are you down on the, that lower, the steep of the slope? The real tricky thing, you know, the real tricky thing is just that, um, you know, we want to know what the snowpack structure is on that steeper slope. And so can you, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of an advanced technique of whether or not you feel like you can,
extrapolate the snowpack that you're looking at right there onto that steeper terrain because the snow structure has got to be the same to get a similar result. Doug. So ski, ski cutting works better on steep slopes. Avalanche initiation, which is kind of what you're saying, yep. safe on that flat slope because you're not going to make an avalanche. Right. So something is involved there. It seems like there's a shear force that's changing, a vector due to gravity that changes as you steepen the slope. I wonder about ice layers or something where it's just a friction thing. You know, what's the difference between a surface floor layer or other layers that you're talking about in this talk versus something that's just zinging off on the ice layer? Would that be different? Well, friction is really important, right? Because you saw on that, that, you know, the thing where I got on a little bit steep, too steep a slope and it woomph and, you know, the crack came out. Now, if I was on a 35, if that whole thing was 35 degrees, I think I would have been off to the races for sure. So you know, at that point, that had enough, you know, we were able to propagate the fracture easily, right? But then, boom, the thing came down and there wasn't enough, um, there wasn't enough, you weren't on a steep enough slope to overcome the friction along the bed surface. So, you know, certainly you're gonna trigger avalanches more easily on steeper terrain because um, there's, you've got gravity working in your favor against that friction. It's hard to sort the two out. For me, it's still, it's, you know, the, the, the test is saying one thing, just just about collapse, I guess, Yeah. is what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's saying something. Isolating the friction and that, and, that, and that force vector isn't helping you. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I mean, to me, it, it really felt counterintuitive. But Are then, on an ice layer? what's that? Have you done a similar set of tests on an ice layer? I don't know, Ron, release? have you? Have you? You yeah, know, we don't get that many ice layers. <laughs> we get too many. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't see a difference uh, on ice layers. What I, you know, what I do see is uh, uh, basically it's friction. So uh, you see, uh, you see fracture propagates, and that's usually, you know, it's Good sign of fracture going across flat is uh, sympathetic, um, but the friction what stops it from actually sliding. Yeah, Bruce. Uh, so I think in the 1999 paper in the uh, or article in the Avalanche Review, uh, we looked at uh, the number of taps and the compression tests on different slope angles starting at zero up to 25 or 30. And we did see a reduced number of taps on the steeper slopes, but uh, I've come to interpret that in terms of uh, on the steeper slopes, we always level after the easy taps, and therefore the back of the shovel is closer to the weak layer, and it's also down in stiffer snow. And that's why I think in the zero to 25 degree range, why we were seeing a uh, reduced number of taps. And again, it's not a huge data set, uh, but that started, we started at zero degrees, and we did see a reduced number of for, uh, on the steeper slopes. But again, we, after the easy taps, we throw we, we level the top of the column, so the back of the shovel is <coughs> closer to the weak layer and, and in stiffer snow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't been able to, you know, I mean, I've, I've looked at the data and I haven't been able to really rectify it with what we've seen. I mean, I, I know that some of these slopes that we've looked at, they're just, I felt good about them because they're so consistent. You know, the, 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 the slab depths are just really consistent. And of course, it's over this perfect weak layer. And, you know, we got to understand that the world isn't perfect. And the world isn't like the, the little study slopes because, you know, we go all over the forest trying to find like one of these slopes. And we finally find one and we mess around on it, you know. So, but what we, you know, but you can sort of see what we, what we saw at least with this data set. Somehow we're saying collapse isn't slope dependent, but movement is. Right, yeah. yeah. That the propagation, the propagation is slope independent, according to work with the PST and the ECT, but obviously avalanches <coughs> are slope dependent, highly slope dependent, because of that movement. Yeah. Is Ned convinced? Is Ned convinced? He has actually now collected a couple of different data sets, and at first he wasn't convinced and the more data sets he collects, the more convinced he becomes. What's happened with him is he's had a very difficult time finding real consistent snowpack. So every slope he goes to, there's, you know, his slab depths are varying and stuff. 
And um, so there's a lot more scatter in his data. You know, these data look pretty darn clean. Who's his, Ned? Uh, oh, who's Ned? Ned Bear is, um, he's, he's a, um, a researcher from California. He did his degree with, with Jeff Dozier, and he was a longtime patroller at Mammoth Mountain, and now he does research for Corel. And so he's done a lot of work on, on fracture as well. And yeah, I think Ned is becoming more convinced. Um, he's, he's sent every, every week or two, he sends me another data set. And there's a lot of scatter, but there, the lines are, you know, the trend lines are fairly flat. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a bit of a disjointed question, but sort of from the, the take home, I gather, on the slope side of things is, yeah, why not dig on the flats? gather some information for either exposing yourself or just more pits better, right? Yeah. But on the other side, I, I, I've seen your sort of trend on working on this data, and I just, it seems like the compression test versus the ECT test on this particular topic is the opposite of everything else we're seeing comparing the ECT and the CT. Can you so, so are you saying that when you guys compare the, the CT and the ECT, that you see their, um, their scores diverge as you get on a steeper train? Not necessarily just slope dependent, but just finding the ECT to be that much more effective, whereas your data is saying they pretty much are comparable results regardless of Well, I guess what I, I guess I wouldn't say that that these results show that the CT test is is, is is has comparable results to the ECT test necessarily. I mean, here we're just looking at the problematic weak layer and we're looking at ECTs that actually propagate. And we're trying to compare the score for those to the score for the CT. And with the idea being, is the CT, you know, is the CT potentially slope independent or at least doesn't have a big slope dependency associated with it? I think the, the big take home is, you know, you may want to go out and dig on a 45 degree slope, but there's no reason not to start at 25. Right? I mean, you can start at 25, and if you get a result you don't like at 25, you know, you're probably going to get a result you don't like at 45, right? And you, but you might get a result that's fairly similar. And then if, if the snowpack's similar, but, you know, if you get a result that you like at 25, hopefully that will give you a little bit more confidence, you know, if you, if you trust the representativity of that snow pit and that snowpack to, to move on to that other terrain to do your test. But um, you might start at the lower angles. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah. Um, in terms of a decision, uh, who cares about a few taps? Don't you care about the fracture character? Yeah, that's really what it comes down to. You know, the fracture character, or whether or not the the ECT propagated, yeah. and so ultimately, you know, some of this stuff, the number of taps and stuff. We we're largely doing that to try and see if they met with different um, fracture models. And also whether or not you could just use the test there. But yeah, whether or not it propagates is the key thing. Thanks, Bruce. I should mention, too, that you all should buy Bruce a beer at the end of the day because we're really working him today. You can see how many times he's on the schedule. <laughs>